All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with molecular geometry and bonding theories. Um, this is going to be taken from Chapter 9 in the Zumdahl textbook. Um, some of the information will be here. Um, you also want to go back make sure you're also doing the reading um, because just so, um, it may give a little bit more clarity to some of the things I'm saying. Um, let's take it off from where we are. Now, at the end of Chapter 8, we leave off talking a little bit about Lewis structures, you know, um, we start to see how the valence electrons are bonded around a central atom, um, how other atoms are connected, and these are starting to give us um, a little bit of an idea of how it's arranged. But now we want to look at the actual molecular shape. Now, of course, all of this is going to be based on models because we cannot see an individual molecule. But we want to look at um, the overall shape in terms of, or it's going to be determined by, the bond angles. What do I mean? As we make these different connections, what you're going to see is you're going to start to see um, the repulsion of the electrons, and that's going to make a big difference in the overall um, structure of things. Now, the bond angles are determined by what we call VESPER theory. VESPER stands for, VESPER, sorry, um, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And this is basically giving us the idea that electrons will try to get as far away from each other as possible. The path of least resistance is the, is the model of the electron. So, what's going to make up this idea is we got to look at the non-bonded electron pairs as well as the bonded electron pairs. And we're going to find that the non-bonded electron pairs tend to take up a little bit more space. Well, not a little bit, a lot more space. Now, the basic idea we're going to start with is for our Vesper theory looking at something as a central atom and how many things are um, connected to it. And this can be from one all the way to six other things that are connected. <clears throat> but the first thing we have to determine is how many electron domains are there around the central atoms, or how many places will we find electrons, either bonded or non-bonded, or lone pairs, around the central atom. This is going to tell us our um, Vesper shape. And so let's go ahead and take a look at the next one. Also, double or triple bonds only count as one domain, so that's just a little something to keep in mind. So, let's see. The arrangement around the central atom in terms of A, B, N molecule is its electron domain geometry, or what we'll use as a Vesper shape. There are five different domain ge geometries that we're going to find. The first, linear, where we have two electron domains, trigonal planar, but we have three different domains, and we're going to look at some examples of these in just a second. Tetrahedral, where we have four domains. Trigonal bipyramidal, where we have five domains. And last but not least, octahedral, where we run into six domains. Now, do not confuse your mind and say, octahedral, that must mean there are eight. No, there are only six domains around, and you'll understand why in just a few moments. Now, here are a couple of the shapes that we're talking about. And you notice that we have the different bond angles also represented here. Um, for a linear um, bond or a liter linear relationship, you notice that you have a 180 degree separation um, due to the difference in, in the electrons and the repulsion that's going to happen. Um, also, trigonal planar has three domains, and you see the shape and it all is within one plane. That's where the planar part comes in. We have four domains, of course, tetrahedral, and five and six you also see here, and you look and see the different bond angles that make up um, these different geometries. Now, <coughs> looking at an example, if we have CO2, before we've drawn the, the Lewis structure and we looked at the fact that we're going to have a double bond, between the carbon and oxygen, each of the oxygens. Now, around the carbon, this is going to give us two domains. Because there are two electron domains on the carbon, the shape has to be linear. And to be even more specific, you may hear some say linear triatomic. Whereas, if we look at water, looking at what happens around the oxygen, you're going to notice that there are actually four domains. So this based is so the shape is going to be based on a tetrahedral. Now, when we come to the overall shape, we're going to take it even a step further in just a few moments. Now, 
molecular geometry. This is kind of the more important or the more useful in terms of what we're going to do. Why do I say that? It's the arrangement of atoms in space around that central atom. Um, and so we have to pay attention to both the bonding pairs as well as the lone pairs or the unbonded pairs to understand what's going to go on. Once we've drawn our Lewis structure, we need to then count the number of bonding domains and the number of non-bonding domains. We're also going to see this when we come into um, bond order in just a few. Now, because oxygen has two bonding areas as well as two non-bonding domains, we're actually going to look at our chart and it's going to tell us what the actual shape is going to be. Information that we have, and you can use this from your textbook, um, both of these charts are listed within your textbook um, for the Vesper Theory, it's at the end of Chapter 8, and for the mo um, Molecular Geometry, it's under Localized Electron Model, and you're actually going to see the same information. Now, if we're looking at what we have, we know that the shape is based on a tetrahedral um, electron domain geometry, but we have two pair of bonding domains as well as two pair of non-bonding domains. And we see this here at the bottom of the screen. This lets us know that it's going to have actually a bent shape. This is our key piece of information. So we can determine these shapes just by knowing how many bonding pairs and how many non-bonding pairs. If it had three, then it would be trigonal pyramidal and so forth. So you just want to keep in mind, and this is actually something you want to take the time to memorize um, how it's going to work, and even some good examples so you can always go back to it. Um, looking at the same information, again, this is all in your textbook, so I do expect that you're going to take the time to go back over it, but looking at the overall electron uh, domain geometry versus how many things are actually connected to it and how those angles will change. Now, the most common shapes that we actually run into with this, though, are going to be tetrahedral, pyramidal, bent, linear, and trigonal planar. If you have some of these in your mind as you continue to go, it's going to be your best friend. It's going to help you out a lot. So you want to make sure that you have examples of each of these five um, molecular geometries so that if you run across them on a test, you can always go back to um, and understand why, why they are the way that they are. Now, the ideal angle between the central atom and the other atom should be noted. For each of these, we do realize that there will be a change, but there is an ideal um, bond angle for each of these. What's going to help or hurt the chances of this is looking at the number of electron pairs that are around. Let's look at an example. Well, for linear, it's going to be 180. Tetrahedral is going to be 109.5. Trigonal planar, 120. And um, those are the main ones um, that we're going to deal with, at least at this time. Now, due to the lone pairs of electrons on the pyramidal and bent shapes, the ideal bond angle will usually actually be less than 109.5. What do I mean? Let's take a look at each of these examples. Our first example here is methane gas, or methane. When we look at the molecule, there is an equal amount of repulsion around each hydrogen. And so it keeps them at that ideal space of 109.5 degrees. But as we look at ammonia in our next diagram, you notice that it has that lone pair sitting around the top. That lone pair is going to extend a little bit of a force and force the hydrogens down a little bit further and then a little bit closer. So it's actually going to be about 107 degrees in terms of the bond angle. Now, if we continue on looking, now we're dealing with water which we said before is a um, tetrahedral shape, um, a bent um, has a bent molecular geometry, but it also has two lone pairs. Those two lone pairs are not only fighting against each other, so they're going to force them further apart, but they're also fighting around about the electrons going around the hydrogens, forcing them in even closer to about 104.5 degrees. So you want to keep these things in mind that based on the things that are actually connected, that will determine your bond angle. That's what was meant at the beginning of the PowerPoint. Now, in general, multiple bonds repel more as do lone pairs. So when we look at the lone pairs that are out there um, on an atom, they're usually going to put up a big fight. But also the same idea is true for a 
multiple bond, like a double bond or a triple bond. This is going to continue to help us actually in the end because you see, you'll begin to see the amount of strain that's there and that helps us to understand why there's so much energy released when we break certain bonds as well as, as opposed to um, when we break some smaller single bonds, some simpler bonds. Now, this is just an idea of the amount of space diagram-wise that is taken up by electrons, whether it be a bonding pair or a non-bonding pair. And you're able to see the amount of energy and the amount of space that's actually taken up um, by those electrons in a non-bonding pair. <coughs> and this is just another example that shows that difference um, based on the bond angles that you're um, actually recording. Now, most of what we've talked about has been based on having a central atom. And there are some situations where you don't necessarily have one central atom. Um, in the case of acetic acid, we actually have three interior atoms. And based on each individual atom, there will be a different shape. What do I mean? If we start with our carbon all the way to the left of the screen, you're going to notice that it has four different things connected to it. And we already know that carbon has a tetrahedral shape, or it has four elect, uh, regions of electron density and it has four different things connected to it, so its shape is actually going to be tetrahedral. Whereas our second carbon, um, looking at how things are connected to it, noticing that we're all in one plane, it's actually going to be trigonal planar. And the last but not least is our oxygen, which is actually going to take on a bent formation, um, even though it is still a tetrahedral electron density. Now, we'll pick this next part up in part two. Make sure to study, rewind, take any notes that you have to, and we'll pick this up in the next video. Have a great evening.